Please be seated. Good morning. We are here today for oral argument in case number CV 190030. Council, uh, each side will have uh, 20 minutes for your argument. Uh, the appellant may uh, uh, reserve a portion of that time for rebuttal. If you decide to do so, I would only ask you keep track yourself. There's a clock at the podium. Uh, these proceedings are being uh, audio and video recorded, so uh, please identify yourself and your client uh, when you begin. Um, uh, we're also live streaming on, uh, I guess, YouTube. Um, we have read the briefs uh, and conferenced the case this morning. We're familiar uh, with the issues raised, and please keep that uh, in mind. And with that, uh, counsel, you may proceed. Good morning, Your Honors. My name is Craig Martin, the firm in Jayberg and Wilf, and with me is my partner, Jeff Silence. We are here representing plaintiff below appellant here, um, Tim Slater. You know, I was reviewing, reviewing the motion to dismiss that brought us here and comparing it to the opening brief, and it struck me that this case is about ironies. The, the first irony that's so obvious is the bulk of the opening brief, the answering brief is dedicated to the idea that the release of that report is a public record. And yet you don't even see the word public record in the motion to dismiss. And, not, and so fa legally, I don't know they can bring the issue, but factually it's so ironic that they now stand in front of this court and claim this is a that this terribly damaging investigative report, which was intended to be confidential, is somehow a public record when in 2010, when it was mistakenly released, within months of releasing it, they write and say that was a mistake, we shouldn't have released it, it was in violation of our policies and practices. But it was clearly a public record, right? You wouldn't dispute definitionally that it was a public record. I'm sorry, Steve. You wouldn't dispute definitionally that it was a public record, right? It was. It was not. It was um, not I a public apologize record. with all due respect. It could be a public record. The definition of a public record is not made in the statutes, as you know. Um, the case no, law it's has Matthews made... v. Pyle, but but the, it, there's not really. I don't think a legitimate argument that this isn't a public record. The argument is whether it's a public record subject to disclosure, right? That, that, fair and, enough. And, and, that, and that probably, I think where you're going with this is that that distinction isn't really before us today. Uh, and if you're successful today, that distinction may be something you'll get to spend a lot of time arguing about in the future because there very well may be uh, privileges asserted, but they're not before us today. Is that, is that a fair um, summary? Better than I could have said, Your Honor. To, to add to that, though, um, you are right that from a pure technical standpoint, this is a document prepared by the public, by, by, prepared by a EEO officer in the course of their job. Um, yeah. But 39121 and Matthews v. Pyle, there, there's no way you could say, oh, this just isn't a public record. But what this is, and the way I should have more carefully presented it, is 
it is a document that may not be subject to disclosure because the university right the university has a right by case law statute policy and procedure to make a discretionary determination about whether this or other documents should be disclosed and the university so clearly said we determined that this is not subject to disclosure they said so in 2010 within months of mistakenly releasing it they said so in 2006 15 when it became public read by a congressman on the congressional record for goodness sakes and it they said it was released by mistake and it was quote a judged not to be a public record they said so again when we saw that when Tim slaughtered Slater sought the record me so it's not a public record we're not giving it to you so for them to now say to you it is a public record when their own brief says well it's a matter of discretion well again I mean we have limited time here you may want to move past this point because if we agree that 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 the public record issue isn't before us today okay it's it's well let's move to the other incredible irony that I find here the other irony arises out of the case and I'm probably going to mispronounce it heroes versus Alcoa they state that he rose quote severely limited the sources of duty they say that he rose basically says only the legislature can create a duty from which an claim of negligence could arise and they say the executive branch has no role they couldn't be further from let me rephrase the irony is that there is such a different way to read heroes than the way that they portray it in the brief and if you want one irony I think that that case which didn't come out when we filed our opening brief or was just coming out they didn't cite it is a case upon which we would have based our entire opening brief had it been available to us so if you have a roadmap to understanding heroes we'll give you extra time just just that's the road matter so counsel let me ask you looking at the minute entry of the court here on the motion to dismiss the court I think I think gives possibly two bases for dismissing this lawsuit one is the duty issue that has been briefed by by counsel today but then there's another sentence in which the court says the Board of Regents breached his right to confidentiality so my question to you is what was the basis of the court's decision was it the absence of a duty or there's a duty it just wasn't breached I'll be honest with you I don't recall the language you just quoted I read their decision to say we didn't cite anything that established a duty and there was none and quite honestly we cited quite a few documents in or quite a few policies and procedures in our complaint that don't directly apply to the University of Arizona because we wanted to establish a public policy about keeping records like this confidential so if the decision if the decision refers to a duty and and seems to indicate an assessment of whether that is breached that's not what happened below what below what was argued was duty duty and and the court by by saying that that there was no breach of his duty to confidentiality or his right to confidentiality wasn't identifying the issue briefed well first there was no argument below there was purely briefing a motion to dismiss well that's argument apply yes sir and then an emotion to reconsider but again your honor I read there the judge's ruling to say she found there was no duty and we made every effort to show there was one it's a safer ruling because under Markowitz saying there was no breach would be nearly impossible on a motion to dismiss sure but when when we talk about your claim that there's a duty here what I didn't see a citation maybe I missed it I didn't see that citation to Cohen v. Coles or anything like that but it it struck me that the there's sort of a combined theme in your quest for a duty that relies partly on promissory estoppel partly on voluntary undertaking and those doctrines 
don't really find their roots in the statute, but I think they're still widely regarded as valid bases for a due. Well, you're missing the one that I think most critical, which is the special relationship. One of the things that Quinoz clarified, but which had been recognized in prior cases, including Gibson, is the nature of a special relationship. That's where a duty comes about. And that's the one I understand least, so maybe you can help me. But let me set you up for it. You mentioned Gibson. Gibson pretty clearly says the absence of a duty just means that there's a class of cases for which there can be no recovery, right? So if you have a special relationship, we can't say that there's never any recovery between these people filling these roles. But that's only part of the Gibson analysis. That means you're not out of court, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a duty. In other words, I mean, you have a, you and I suppose, I think have some sort of a relationship because you're a business invitee on these premises, right? And so there's probably some sort of duty to you, but there's a lot of things that you couldn't sue me for because the duty doesn't extend to those spheres of conduct. So how do we get a duty? We've got a relationship, great, but how do we then get a duty that extends to this sphere of conduct? I see Gibson as, if you will, a step in the way to Quiroz. And the way I read Quiroz is that a duty exists between an employer and an employee. An employer has a duty not to be negligent and negligently injure the employee. In fact, that specific way, Quiroz cites specifically to Better Built, Bolt versus Better Built, which says just that, that an employer has a duty not to do, not to injure its employee. It's a very simplistic approach, but it may actually be correct. I mean, I think a lot of people tend to overthink Gibson and Quiroz. I may be one of them. But you're just saying that Gibson stands for the proposition that once you have the relationship, any unreasonable conduct that causes harm to that person is actionable. Maybe you're right. I don't believe so. Okay. I don't think that Gibson's ever been explained that way. So that you understand, our position is first, that because of the mere existence of a special relationship, any negligent conduct, unreasonable is another good word, which causes injury, is actionable because of the special relationship. But we have other reasons too. Yes, Your Honor. And I think, just to unpack that a little, isn't the special relationship a factual issue that goes to duty, that the judge has to know the facts and say, you've got it, and the judge decides that based on those facts? The tricky part there, of course, is that it's for the court in the first instance to determine the existence of a duty. But where there are disputed facts that might go to that question, I think that you're right. Well, we may hear from your colleague shortly on this issue, but I'm walking into this with the assumption that there is no dispute as to the employer-employee relationship here, the existence of that relationship. We allege that, therefore, it's no dispute, Your Honor. Fair enough. But there isn't a dispute anyway, as a practical matter. But the special relationship could go further, can't it? It could be, it may not have been enough just to be an employer-employee, but then there was a further promise. And that establishes, because you don't need an employer-employee relationship to get that special relationship. Sure. The second way that a duty can rely is when you make an undertaking to do something. And under the facts which you must accept as true, their undertaking was, we're going to investigate whether there was a sexual charged relationship in the astronomy department in 2004 at the University of Arizona, and we're going to keep it confidential. They told that to Tim Slater. They told it to the witnesses. And when they wrote the report, they wrote in big, I think it's 18-point type, bold face across every page, confidential. They took no disciplinary action. All of those things show, coupled with the university's own regulations, which for some reason now they say don't apply. Well, let's talk about that. Those regulations, they exist. And they say that the university has to keep certain things confidential. How can you, for lack of a better word, weaponize that and make that an actionable claim? Are you saying, you know, 
that there's a special relationship and thus all of these uh, administrative yes, regulations apply? Because if you look at the regulations, they don't say anything about lawsuits. What the regulations say is that these things will be kept confidential. You read the two regulations and it is an undertaking by the university to keep confidential the very information they later negligently made public. I'm telling you that I believe this, a special relationship creates the, the duty, an undertaking to do certain things which you don't later do creates the duty. And, and by the way, one quick thing while we're talking about the regulations, I find it interesting that the university in their motion to dismiss says this on uh, page 4, lines 10 or 11 of the motion to dismiss. Slater argues that ABO policy 6-912 subpart 4 prohibited the U of A from disclosing the investigative report. Their words, not mine. For purposes of this motion, the court must take these facts as true. Again, that's another irony to me, how they can now say, oh, those policies don't say what they say and argue they say something different when below they say it's a factual issue which you must accept is true on the motion well, to dismiss. Very wade, confusing. If we're going to wade back into the irony, then let me ask you to engage in a collateral exercise and, and assume this is just a public records request. You're the requester. Take me through your Carlson analysis of why this should or should not be produced. And should or should not is probably a, a poor way of saying it must or must not be produced. Because typically these, these Carlson factors, which I think you're relying on, are kind of discretionary. Uh, exactly. Is there a mandatory command sure. other yeah. than a regulate? Because we wouldn't let the state of Arizona just promulgate a regulation that undoes the public records, right? We wouldn't say uh, every, could, every document. Couldn't agree more. So um, how do we get to a mandatory non-disclosure? Carlson specifically says, as do a number of other cases, that you look at a number of factors one is expectation of privacy. One is personal, pri personal and private information. Sure. And, and, and that, in this case, they created an expectation of privacy. They created this is personal information, slowly but related. That justifies non-disclosure, or could, right? right? I mean, it would give the state a credible argument coming into court if it w wanted to withhold the documents. But I didn't see anything in there that said it was mandatory that they not disclose. Uh, yeah, actually, Your Honor, I would suggest that if you read ABR 1-109, which applies to all university people, it says all board and university employers who in their administrative capacity receive reports of discrimination, harassment, or retaliation, which is this, shall maintain the confidentiality of the information they well, that's, receive. That's not, I understand. That's, that's literally me. what it says, but, but, but who's saying the, the problem I have is, is that historically in Arizona, personnel records and, and the like have been open. They, I mean, we have a one sentence public records law. And, and if I ask for the personal records of a building inspector from the city of Phoenix, let's say, those should be produced in the ordinary course. Oh. If the city of Phoenix says, we're not doing that anymore, does it have authority under the, the statute? No, Your Honor, it does not. And but so how is I, the I disagree with your, your, your uh, uh, presumption because no personnel records are not presumed to be disclosed. Quite the opposite. If you read the administrative code, which doesn't apply, as I now admit, to the I University prefer, of Arizona. I prefer to read statutes. Questions. Pardon? I prefer to read statutes than administrative codes, especially when those codes have been all but gutted. Well, the statute specifically, I think it's subpart A, it talks about personnel records, and it says only those parts dealing with discipline. Um, I, uh, let me get so you. So is that the which point? statute are we talking about now? Well, I'll get you the statute, Your Honor. Uh, it is. Uh, since, since we're arguing about that, it, it's about the eighth in the list of so, public so, records, so records, even though we're not really the, arguing. The investigation, they, they didn't discipline your client for sexual harassment. They made him take a course. They, they made it take, and, and they had a finding uh, that, uh, that there was maybe some untoward activity or conduct. Yes. Is that relevant? Like if they had, if, if, the, if the report said affirmatively, uh, uh, that your client had uh, engaged in sexual harassment, uh, is is it 
is it now uh, uh, still um, a lawsuit for for the for the uh, university to produce the resort the, the the results of an investigation that yielded a negative result for your client? Uh, it has nothing to do. Well, it has to do with the negative results. It rather it was rather the circumstances under which the report was created, the promises made on creation, the right. promises I, I'm, made on completion. I'm exploring that discretionary part. Uh, okay, so let's say that this investigation found affirmative misconduct and sanctioned your client. Could that report have been disclosed? Yes. Um, well, I'm going to say yes if they hadn't promised confidentiality. Yes, I believe that a report like this could be within, is within public records laws and within the university policies discretionary and therefore could be subject to release. But under the circumstances of this case, they exercised that discretion and said we're not. They told him they were not before they created the report. And all of those things make that discretion removed, if you will. And, and at a minimum, it's a fact question for a jury to decide, not one that should be decided on and motion isn't to dismiss. And isn't that the challenge in this case? The duties are triggered by facts in this case. The court ultimately may be able to resolve it on summary judgment if there isn't a dispute about the facts. But at the motion to dismiss phase, which is where we're at, those facts just haven't been developed, but you've alleged them. Is that a fair statement? Well, uh, I'd say that our details... Perhaps you would disagree that the court could resolve <laughs> so, it on summary somewhat, judgment, too. But. I, uh, of course, but I believe that the facts we laid out, which must be accepted as true, do establish a duty on their part and do establish a breach of that, which means it shouldn't have been decided. I agree that facts may later arise that put it again into a jury question, uh, which may then be determined by summary judgment, although I doubt it. I believe ultimately... Um, whether there's a duty is going to be determined by the court, and there will be, um, or at most, um, and, and whether there's a breach will be decided by the jury. Thank you, counsel. Uh, I guess I don't have any time to reserve. Oh, well, you got nine I'll seconds. I'll be back if you have questions. Good morning, Your Honors. Rachel Remus appearing for the Arizona Board of Regents. I'd like to start with addressing the public records issue that came up. That is absolutely before this court. It was not raised in the motion to dismiss because the motion to dismiss focused primarily on the statutory, regulatory, and policies upon which Slater bases his breach of confidentiality and negligence claims. It is self-evident that the university deemed that report to be a public record. If you look at exhibits three and four to the complaint, which are the uh, response. Is self-evident that it's a public record or it should have been disclosed or was disclosed worthy? It, it's self-evident the university deemed that report to be a public record and produced it as such. The letters that accompanied um, the initial production of the report said, we are producing this document. What about that letter, the follow-up letter, um, what was it, like 50 days later saying, destroy what we sent you? Your Honor, yes, it, he did send that letter. That's Exhibit 4 to the complaint. It's still a public record. I think that the plaintiff confuses the notion of what is a public record and an accept. I think we bridged that gap. I think you, you have an a, a agreement here that at its core, this document is a public record. The question then becomes, is it producible either on a discretionary or mandatory basis? And I suppose the question for another day might be, does the public, the fact that it's a public record uh, create some defenses? But you didn't raise those below and we can't really talk about them here. Your Honor, you're absolutely correct. I wanted to make clear that the university has never maintained that the report is not a public record. It was produced as a public record. There is an exception to the public records law, and that allows the university or any governmental entity that is subject to Arizona's public records law to balance interest and to withhold a public record that is presumed to be open to public inspection. You're talking about Carlson, not a statute, right? That's correct. Okay. And, so, and so that, let me just 
before I lose track, focusing on the question I asked Mr. Martin, is does Carlson, is it your contention that Carlson creates no mandatory duties of non-disclosure? Yes, Your Honor. The way that a duty is created was very clearly established in Key Rose. Key Rose said that the way a duty that is recognized by law is created. But, I'm sorry, but Key Rose is a tort case. I'm talking about a duty of disclosure under the public records law, which has nothing to do with Carlson. Well, Your Honor, okay, I'm sorry. Let me clarify. We were talking Carlson. Carlson, there is no duty to Slater under the Carlson balancing test, either to produce or not. That's a discretionary function, and the university takes that risk. So tell me, is there ever an instance in which your client would produce documents that would give rise to a claim? Or is it just everything is discretionary? No, not everything is discretionary. The legislature has enacted numerous statutes. The statutes are referenced in the Ellis case at footnote three. It tracks to the Attorney General's Office handbook. Hundreds of categories of documents are confidential by law, and the university may not release that information. Some examples might be like medical records, for example. That could create a cause of action because there's a breach of a statute that prohibits its release. Here, there is no statute. There is no case that prohibited the university from releasing that report in response to a public records request. You do have a regulation that says you're going to keep them confidential. The regulation does not, Your Honor, say that the investigative report must be kept confidential. It doesn't say must, but you call them confidential reports. It actually does not even. What does it call them? What is the university's rule with regard to these reports? What does it call them? 6912 refers to personnel records and information. It never refers to investigative reports. What about the actual report? Doesn't the report confidential? Doesn't the report at the head of the heading of every page of 38 pages have in bold and italics the word confidential? It does, Your Honor. Each page of that report contains the designation confidential. But the fact that it says it's confidential does not create a duty that is recognized by law, which Mr. Slater must establish in order to state a negligence claim in this case. I want to get there next, but let me just clarify on this. Are the regulations time-bound at all? Time-bound? In other words, if something's confidential under the regulation, it's confidential for the next 10,000 years, right? Because there's no expiration date on confidentiality under the regulation. If the university or the Arizona Board of Regents changes its policy, then that could mean that the university no longer deems a category of documents confidential. But assuming the university is defunded and the only employee left is a clerk protecting all these records, the clerk would then be bound by this confidentiality designation forever until it's changed. No. I think Arizona's public records law supersedes a board policy. The public records law is a statute. So you're saying that's a very fair response, not quite what I was getting at. I was asking for your interpretation of the regulation, not whether it's superseded by statute. Let's assume for a moment that it's not, even though that's a bad assumption. And let me just ask you, the way the regulation is written, does the confidentiality ever end by its own terms? No, I don't think that issue is raised in the regulation. What the regulation says is the university may balance interest and the public records custodian confers with counsel and determines whether that record can and should be produced. Because you said this. So there's no regulation directed at harassment or investigations of this sort. It's strictly an employee record. Or does ABOR have some regulations that address how they handle these investigations and disclosure of them? The university's policy 6912 addresses personnel records and public records requests. That policy does not make any reference to investigative records. So if the university... Is there a regulation, though, about investigative records? Not public records and, but just about how you handle investigative records. 
There is a policy, Your Honor, it's cited in the records. It's 1119, and that is the equal employment policy, but it does not govern whether that can be. Does it say anything about confidentiality? It does. What does it say? What it says is individuals who at the university in their administrative capacity receive reports of sexual harassment, they're to keep that confidential. And we've put in the record before the Superior Court the policies that interpret what that means. That does not include the public records custodian specifically. So now my question is, does that mean the university has to exercise discretion, or can the university just send them out without doing it? Or does it create an obligation to at least exercise discretion in whether you send them out? The policy does not create a duty recognized by law to do that, but it makes perfect sense to do that. Does the university exercise discretion when it looks at these and decides we're going to send these but not those? Absolutely. Is there anything in the record that addresses whether that happened here? I think so. It's in the Exhibits 3 and 4 attached to the complaint, and those are the words of the public records custodian. In the first letter in which he produced the report, he says, we're withholding several categories of records because the university balances those interests. What about the university's vice president who said somebody screwed up? Your Honor, the plaintiff is referring to a hearsay statement in a news article. This is a 12B. This is a motion to dismiss. But whether a document is a public record is a question of law for the court to decide. In the reply brief, it got absolutely wrong. It's not a fact question for the court to decide. It's a question of law. The Ellis Court says that explicitly. So this is not something that the court must accept as true. If it's a question of law, the court must make that determination. So all we have to decide it's a public record, we're done, the university can do no harm? No. The issue before the court is whether there is a duty, as that term is defined by law. And if Slater has not established a duty, as that's recognized by law, he has no case. But what about the express, which we have to take as true, statement that your client made to Dr. Slater before the interview that this will be held confidential? A promise of confidentiality will not defeat a governmental entity such as the university's obligation to produce a public record. And then where is that? Can you show me that case or that statute? That is the Moorhead case that we cite in our answering brief. Moorhead says that. Yes, it does. You cannot have a verbal duty that would effectively modify or trump a public records, I guess, determination. What Moorhead says, Your Honor, is a little bit different in that a promise of confidentiality, a mere promise of confidentiality alone, will not remove that category of documents from the university's obligation to make that accessible. But could it create a level of duty? It may not remove it from that, but a duty to do something more than just send it out. I think, no, not a legally enforceable duty, Your Honor. So no special relationship created when the promise was made this will be confidential. There is no special relationship here because we need to talk about that. Section 314B of the restatement establishes a special relationship, but that's only as to physical injuries. If you look at the Quiros decision upon which Slater relies, the court specifically references 314B and all of the cases interpreting that particular restatement provision refer to physical injury or death. But does it say it can't be another kind of injury or is it just happenstance that right now it only cites those? There is no court that has applied 314B. Is there a case that says it doesn't? I have not. By the same token. I've not seen one. No one's ever said that. I think you could imagine pretty easily putting the brakes on that doctrine if every employee were able to sue her employer for economic harm because every bad business judgment could then potentially place an employee at risk. I get it. But my focus now in our remaining time has to be the question I didn't want to ask, which is why is this case before us in this posture? Why are we examining angels on the head of a pin when it comes to duty when there's a large looming privilege issue out there that was not argued? A privilege issue, Your Honor? Yeah. 
I think I thought that's where you were going with the whole public records thing is there is a there is there are privileges associated with official actions concerning public record and I don't see that in this case no I think the reason we're here is that Slater has failed to establish a cause of action for damages based solely on a board policy that it is insufficient the key rose decision made clear that a duty recognized by law has to be established either by public policy or special relationship does the board not have the power to announce public policy to a degree does not I think under key rose that that if the board says you know what we don't want any more gender discrimination on campus we're gonna put in policies to prevent gender discrimination on campus are you saying that those regulations are not public policy or are you saying that they can't promulgate no seems to me that they can and they are absolutely a bore has the statutory authority to establish policies and procedures but what what we are talking about your honor is whether there is a duty to establish the the duty of care the first element of a negligence claim which we're going through because Kuros tells us that now we have to look outside the courts for some declaration of public policy it would seem that university regulations could be that right no your honor they could not the key rose left no room for the court to sit to establish public policy did it the key rose did not talk about entities like a bore expressing public policy they have the power to regulate but not the power to consider policy no the no your honor the key rose decision did not say that an administrative straight of regulation could establish a duty of care it didn't address couldn't be but I think it did I think that when the court said look the role of the legislature is to establish public policy courts to a much lesser extent establish public policy but only when that's already been clearly established and there's no substantial doubt so the the issue of whether a bore policy is violated is not relevant unless that a bore policy can form a so under that reasoning then the governor can't establish public policy either because he's not the legislature that's the Attorney General has no public policy role I mean that that strikes me as an over reading of Kuros no key rose specifically says it's the legislature's role to define a duty here's what Kuros says let me give you a quote public policy creating a duty is based on our state and federal statutes and the common law and quote okay so your argument is that sentence means that all these administrative regulations that take up walls of books are irrelevant on the subject of public policy he rose was silent on on the issue of whether administrative regulations can establish a silent aren't administrative regulations promulgated under authority granted by statute they could be under title 41 but they're if they're promulgated without statutory authority they're highly suspect wouldn't you say they could be but in in this case the the policy has to comply with statute and to the extent a bore policy the duty that Slater is arguing exists actually runs counter to the public records law so so you're saying that your clients regulations are unlawful they are not they are no no your honor I am NOT saying they're unlawful they are policies that the University has to follow they do follow them they are not meaningless what I'm saying is policies I'm guessing come from federal law as well which Kuros recognizes heroes can recognize statutory duties that arise under federal statute or state statute but whether the a bore can establish a cause of action based on public policy I think has has been eliminated through heroes because it is not a legislative act and delegation of the legislative authority doesn't change that in other words a bore policy is not a statute from which the court can recognize a duty of care as an essential let's go back to Kuros couple sentences before the one I just read duties based on special relationships relationships may arise from several sources including ellipsis contracts yes but you just said that the assurance that your client gave to dr. Slater that this would be confidential can't create a duty but Kuros says it can he rose was talking about public policy duties or special relationship duty in that context I believe and what the court said is that 
a duty arising under public policy has to come primarily from the legislature. The court can recognize... It was a little squishy about that, though. Kiraz never acknowledged what people accuse it of doing. People describe Kiraz these days as a radical reformation and narrowing of Arizona tort law. It never admits to that. It never expresses an aim to do that. I think it's just trying to categorize the sources of duty. So I would put to you a hypothetical. If ADOT has a regulation that says there shall be guardrails on freeways and somebody builds a freeway without a guardrail causing predictable consequences, are you saying that that regulation is not a source of duty? Under Kiraz, the court said no. It has to come from the statute. Can you read me the language in Kiraz that says that, please? Right. It's just Kiraz dealt with a statute. If I do a word search for administrative in Kiraz, is that going to come up? I mean, does it ever tackle the issue such that we should glean meaning from its silence? Well, I think it does in the sense that when it says that duties have to arise primarily, a public policy-based duty for tort law has to arise primarily from legislature. So if we're not looking at a statute, then we look at other ways that a public policy duty can arise. The court said, as Your Honor referenced, special relationships that could be based on a contract, undertaking of the acts of the defendant. Possibly a promise to keep something confidential. There is no contract issue here. He was an employee. That's correct. Participating in a discussion based on that employee status. On his status, I don't believe that. As an employee. Why would you interview him if he wasn't an employee under a contract? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Of course. Of course. Slater was an employee. So this promise made in the context of a discussion within his employee contract. No, there was no contractual claim. Isn't that then a factual issue that needs to get worked out? No. The duty must be established as a matter of law. It's a question. But the special relationship duty, the courts say that there is a factual aspect to the special relationship, which is why it seems to me that can't get resolved until you're further down the road than a motion to dismiss. How do you resolve it without identifying and giving them a chance to flesh out whether there was a special relationship? Well, there has to be a legally established duty as a special relationship. And the fact that duties, special relationships can be formed by a contract, for example, doesn't... Including an employer-employee, which has been recognized to support that. Yes, but Kiro specifically mentions 314B of the restatement, and that only has been applied to physical injury. And that's reflected in workers' compensation policy. If someone is injured on the job, it makes sense that an employer would have a duty recognized by law to warn an employee of a possible impending harm. Because if an employee is injured on the job, then that could be the exclusive remedy. But a mere promise of confidentiality does not establish a duty. A mere promise of confidentiality does not establish a duty. Taken in the abstract, that's a pretty remarkable statement. Your Honor, what we're talking about is, does Slater have a statutory basis to preclude the university from releasing the report and then... I understand that's what the case is about, but you just said a mere promise of confidentiality does not create a duty. Are you saying that promises are legally irrelevant? No, of course not, Your Honor. Because the U.S. Supreme Court recognized in the Coles Media case that promises do create duties. And it would seem that that case law from the U.S. Supreme Court should at least deserve some attention here. Your Honor, I'm referring specifically to the language that the Morehouse Court used and said that a mere promise of confidentiality does not excuse a government from releasing a public record, any more than the potential that someone may be embarrassed if a public record is released. That would not be a sufficient basis to withhold the report. So to me, what Moorhead stands for is that the government can't hide behind promises of confidentiality, but if it chooses to breach one, there may need to be further analysis, not that the government is just off the hook. 
that do you disagree with that no i don't disagree with that your honor promise of confidentiality the reference to that today here an oral argument as well as in the brief or relates to the public record statute and um and slater's allegation that he was promised some confidentiality but he needs to do much more than than establish that some promise was made and isn't that the point that much more is his opportunity to do the discovery it's not at this stage of a petition of a motion to dismiss it's at the summary judgment stage did he meet his burden to establish it no your honor whether he's established a duty that is recognized by law is a preliminary issue it's a question of fact sometimes a question of law excuse me no but you're right sometimes in the special relationship they do say it's an issue of fact as well i have not seen any cases that say that i i i have not i'm less enamored of the special relationship theory but but what what really sticks with me is restatement section 90 which defines promissory estoppel and and i read as creating duties am i wrong there well the duty not to release a public record and whether um that the university had to deny that public records request there's no legal basis that slater has cited for that and because he's failed to do that he cannot proceed with his negligence claim he rose made very clear that just because a plaintiff is harmed by conduct of a defendant even if there is negligence negligent conduct that fails to establish a cause of action in negligence just a harm that was caused without a duty that is recognized by law fails to state a claim thank you you have more thank you counsel ask you to affirm the judgment thank you we appreciate it could you put one minute so one minute and nine seconds and i'm going to hold you to it so well i was going to use my nine my nine seconds to get a minute to nine uh the the daggett versus maricopa county case cited on page 16 of our reply where in fact a duty was implied purely from maricopa county regulations that required it to inspect and approve of swimming pools a fellow dove into a negligently created pool the county was successfully sued there is a cause of action according to this very court that case was never mentioned um distinguished or referred to in gibson ortiz affected in any way by curacas that exactly um and so there are a whole line of cases that create a cause of action um that's really what i wanted to say to you i don't know what else you wish to deal with i feel your questions recognize that this case doesn't belong in front of this court on a motion to dismiss i recognize there may be some privileges or defenses that could be flushed out and decided on a motion for summary judgment but at the end of the day what the university of arizona did was so terrible it destroyed this man's life and i mean that literally he went from he may have had a hand in that as well right if the report is to be believed the report's not to be believed though that's the problem is that if he was going to be disciplined back in 2004 he would have had a chance to fight tell his side of the story review the report question witnesses there's a whole lot of due process entitled to a especially a tenured professor as he was um which he never got a report was made promising him and everybody else it wouldn't be confidential say just talk to us we won't make this public and and then they say go take a course which he did that's a very different world than a public report saying you're guilty of terrible conduct he denies the vast majority of the conduct referred to but he admits there are things he could have done better in 2004 the world's changed a lot i don't believe he brought it on himself at all your honor thank you counsel thank you both for your arguments uh today and with that uh we will take it under advisement and be adjourned